I want to uh, show you some things. In order to assist the uh, ones introducing the speakers, you know, we have a little cheat sheet, a little biographical sketch just to uh, assist us. Since you know the elders and David, we're not on Facebook all that much, so we can't learn all that there is to learn there. So we have to have something like this. Uh, this one, you know, like Michael Hatcher, do you see that? See that? It's just a uh, chock full of stuff. Just and of course, uh, Doug McClish, it's, I mean, it's small type filled up. And you get to Rolf Ruffner. <laughs> now, does that mean that you haven't been doing anything? I'm busy. Too busy to write it down. Too busy to write it down. <laughs> well, that, that may be the case, but it seems like you haven't been doing anything, so if that's the case, could you get on Facebook and take care of Gene Hill? <laughs> I carry a dial phone. Much <laughs> I've known uh, Rolf um, since the time he was preaching. When, when did you preach, Marlon? 1990 or so. 90 or so, for quite a long time. And when I heard him, I said, you know, this is a good preacher here. He can really preach the word. And that was confirmed by uh, Nancy's mother, uh, Hedy Pearl Garcia, whom a lot of you know, and she thought that he was just an excellent preacher and, and I admired him. And, but like uh, so many places, uh, his tenure there was cut short by men who did not have appreciation for uh, good and gospel preaching. But I have always admired uh, Rolf for his stand for the truth and his uh, preaching abilities. And I have no doubt that uh, he will continue that. He's, he's uh, uh, preaching now for Hilltown Church of Christ near Santa Fe, Tennessee, and he's also a part-time history instructor at uh, Columbia State Community College. And he's going to speak to us tonight on one can know one is a member of the Lord's Church that is identifying the marks of the church. Now, I, I, do, I don't expect you to exceed our expectations. <laughs> Knowing how good a preacher you, you are, I expect you to meet those ex expectations. And I know that you will listen to him as he comes and speaks to us. And uh, David probably has the uh, timer somewhere, so. Can you have 60 minutes? <laughs> yeah, you'll have, uh, uh, since, we, since we only have one session, you can go ahead and take up both of them. <laughs> <Two sessions. laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> well, I figured since my, my sheet was blank that I could do anything I wanted to. But anyway. Brethren, it's good to be with you again. I started coming here, I think it was about 94, something like that. It has been always been a, a wonderful experience. I want to thank you all, first of all, for coming here tonight, for your faithfulness to the Lord. I want to thank Brother Blasting Game for picking me up. I want to thank uh, all the brethren who fed me and taken care of me, and Brother John West, who, who got out his gun last night and got rid of that boogeyman that was on top of the roof. <laughs> I want to thank him for that. Every appreciate for that, I tell you. But uh, it's a wonderful thing to be a Christian, to know fellow Christians, to know that there are others that believe in Jesus Christ and follow his word tonight. One can know one is a member of the Lord's church, in parentheses, the identifying marks of the church. What a wonderful topic that is. I'd like to begin tonight by reading from God's Word, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, where the Apostle Paul, the aged Apostle, said, Unto me, who am less than least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, create all things by Christ Jesus, to the intent that now unto the principles and, prince and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. How wonderful those words are. How wonderful the pure and simple church of Christ is of the New Testament. We long for that simplicity. 
Yet there are so many distractions, distortions that we have today, and so many people come along and they will use the term church, the church, and they don't know what that means. It's as far removed, their idea of the church is, as from what Jesus died for, is from dark from light. You know, religion, I've observed religion for many years now, has become a commodity. Something like potato chips or chewing gum. And that's, it's evident by this refrain you hear many people say, well, you know, just attend the church of your choice, as if there was a choice. There's Christ's choice, and then there's your choice. And the cho your choice is to accept Christ's choice or not to accept it. One other advertising gimmick you see now is, you know, come join our caring family. Come join our caring family. Some denominations and brethren, all they really want is a warm body in that church building. A lot of warm bodies. And warm bodies that put money in the collection plate. Come to our exciting worship. Now, you know how, why it's going to be exciting. They're going to entertain you some way. Have a, have a talking dog or, a, or the preacher's going get, to get up and juggle or whatever they may do. And I love this one. Doesn't matter what you believe, come and be part of our church. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you believe. None of these statements show us anything about the bride of Christ. Remember, that's what we're talking about tonight, the bride of Christ, the church of Christ. Jesus said these wonderful words in Matthew chapter 7. He says, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And there are many which go in thereat. Tonight I will mention many names of denominations. And I do that unashamedly. But also I do not mean, and I know there are many people listening on the internet, watching on the internet, I do not mean to offend anyone by some personal offense, but brethren and friends, when the emperor has no clothes, he has no clothes. And when we talk about denominations, and we name them, and we may even use sarcasm to describe them, we are describing what's real and what is an abomination in the sight of God, a denomination is. But in the midst of all this religious confusion, the truth of God's word shines like a beacon to those in our, in our land. And it does seem today like many do not want to come to that beacon. But there are some that will come. There are some that will come. You know, the Lord, when he died on the cross, that agonizing death, he did die to found a country club or a fraternity or a playhouse, or a religious retreat, or a mission depot, or a sensitivity group, or some emotional playground. That's what many people think the church is, one of those, or something else. And you know, a sizable part of our brethren believe that too. The church is all those things. Do they think of the church as the bride of Christ? No. They think of something to meet their felt needs. Many brethren today no longer see the distinctiveness of New Testament Christianity. They don't see the preciousness of it. They stumble as the Jews did. The Jews stumbled at the stumbling block of Jesus, and they do too today, but especially the stumbling block of the distinctive nature of the church and the necessity of scriptural fellowship. Because, brethren, the church is all we've got in this world. Many people see themselves a part of this monster that's called denominationalism that tries to pass itself off as the church. And many of brethren have, much more eloquent than I, have pointed that out today. But, you know, that's definitely not the case, and it was once not the case, let's put it that way. Once not that long ago, our message was distinctive. 
our plea was to go back to the Bible. In exchange, we were despised. We were ridiculed. We were hated by many people, but we were faithful to the Lord, and we were growing. We were growing when we were hated and despised and ridiculed. Now we're not, and we're not growing. You know, my mother's family, we have, I'm thankful for a, as the liberals like to call it, a heritage, which basically means uh, many of my, my mother's family especially were faithful members of the church, and one was my grandmother, Sabie Langley. And when she was a newlywed, she moved with her husband, my grandfather, to south central Oklahoma, I believe around Apache, in the 1920s to help manage a farm. My grandmother was a faithful Christian. And she couldn't find the Lord's church in that area. She had searched and searched. And one day her young brother-in-law came in and brought her the news that there was one in a nearby town. So my grandmother on Sunday morning loaded up the car, put everybody in there, and tried to find the building. After searching in vain, she pulled into a gas station, asked the attendant for the directions, he didn't know where anything was, much less the Church of Christ. He didn't know what that was. So she was disappointed, disappointed and she was starting to leave. And then he ran out, ran, out, ran out to her and said, Ma'am, there's a strange bunch across the tracks. They take communion every Sunday and they don't use a piney. Well, she, her heart leaped for joy. She thanked the man. They soon arrived at the building. There wasn't any piney or organ or anything like that. She got all the kids seated on the row. One of them looked at her and said, Sabi, did we find the right church? My grandmother answered, yes, we did. Thank God for such stories. Thank God. And I know many of you have them also. So tonight, in these confusing, digressive times, we once again go to a, really a, a very common sermon years ago, a sermon topic, and that is the identifying marks of the church. But you know, there are many people, many brethren especially, who have forgotten that lesson, if they ever heard it. And the question comes down to not so much the, def the identifying marks of the church, but how is the bride of Christ different than the brides of the devil. That's really what it comes down to. It's a stark contrast. Most of our brethren don't know the difference. So what are some of those marks or identifying characteristics of the Church of Christ which set us apart from all this confusion out in the world? And how can we be confident, confident in the fact that we are in my church, Matthew 16, verse 18. The one that we read about in the Bible, the narrow way that leadeth unto life, Matthew 7, verse 14. Brother Brown, when he gave me this topic, he emphasized that it should dwell upon the confidence that we can have. And brethren, we have lost a lot of that confidence. We need to regain it. Know that we are on the Lord's side. Supposedly Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, someone asked him if God was on his side. He said, I don't know, but I want to be on God's side. And that's the way we should be. One distinctive mark in my mind, and there's many things you could talk about this tonight, is that the Church of Christ, Brother Brown in my manuscript, in my manuscript added the faithful Church of Christ, which is very good. The faithful church of Christ is the kingdom of the saved. You know, the Bible reveals that we are, live in two spiritual kingdoms that are coexisting now, really at war with each other. One is Satan's kingdom, the counterfeit church, part of that kingdom. And then you have Jesus' kingdom, which is the church of Christ. And all these denominations out there, these counterfeit churches, claim to be a part, a part of Christ's church. That's what denominationalism is. You're not the church. You're a part of that mystical 
thing they call church, the church. But think about it, brethren. When someone is converted to the Lord, when someone obeys the gospel, when that trembling, believing soul turns from Satan's kingdom, embraces the truth, makes that good confession, and is buried in that watery grave of baptism for remission of sins, what happens? They rise from that water a new creature, a Christian. They have undergone a divorce. They have been divorced from Satan's control, and they've been married to another, Jesus Christ, Romans 7, verse 4. They have met Christ's condition for citizenship in his kingdom, Church of Christ, by being born of water and the Spirit, John 3, verse 5. And they didn't rise up out of that water, a Baptist, or a Presbyterian, or a Catholic, or a Lutheran, or any member of a denomination, or any, even some amorphous, unattached believer. I love that term. A believer. Are you a believer, people will say? That person rises up from that watery grave, a Christian who God has added to the church. Acts 2, verse 47. And brethren, that simple fact... That simple truth alone should fill our hearts with profound gratitude and surety, certainty. As Luke wrote, Theophilus, oh Theophilus, I've, I put this all together so you might know the certainty of what you believe. The certainty. The King, Church of Christ is the kingdom of the saved. But another Mark, identifying Mark the church, is the conditions of membership in the church do not change. Brethren, when you go to the book of Acts, I love the book of Acts. You're struck by the accounts of conversion. The early church of Christ was conditional in who it allowed in as a member. Today, many churches as well as some congregations of the Lord, I'm sorry to say, are unconditional as regards membership in their body. As I mentioned earlier, any warm body will do. Any warm body will do. They totally disregard God's plan of salvation as given in the scriptures. What a travesty. I think it's a travesty when a sermon is preached from the pulpit and the plan of salvation is not given. Because there might be one person out there that doesn't know it. There might be a brother that, uh, or sister in Christ that believes it, but they have forgotten a certain point. They need it re-emphasized again. And what is that plan of salvation? That one must hear and understand the gospel in order to be saved. The Bible indicates that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. But many people out there do not hear the gospel in its fullness. They have no rock to build their house of belief upon. You know, over in Matthew chapter 7, the Lord talked about the man who built the house on the rock, the man who built the house on the sand. We know the rest of the story, as Paul Hard would say. You have others that believe in the Calvinistic false doctrine of Holy Spirit illumination, that the Holy Spirit must work upon the sinner directly so they can understand the Bible. You can't unless you've been illuminated some way, they claim. So you can have faith. They have it backwards. But the Bible teaches that faith only comes after the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, Luke 8, 11, has been planted in the human heart, James 1, verse 21. That's when that precious seed evolves, or grows, rather. That precious seed grows. And bears fruit. So one must hear the gospel. One must believe that gospel. That tells them that Jesus Christ. Is the Christ. And that he died for their sins. And he rose from the dead on the third day. In order. For someone to be saved. They must believe that. It must be the certified. As Paul said in Galatians 1.11. The uncorrupted truth. From God's word. And not some man made teaching. So many people hear half of the truth. 
And it's not, as Paul said, that certified gospel. Because that faith must be a saving faith that causes one to go ahead and obey the rest of God's plan of salvation. It's the starting point. You hear and you believe and you understand. But for many, faith only or belief only is the end of their spiritual journey. What a great travesty. They don't have that active faith which will complete that journey. James says in James 2, verse 19 and 20, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Wilt thou know? Yes, you can know. You can know. The member of the body of Christ does not have that vain faith. He or she knows that they have been saved by obedient faith in the gospel. They can know. But God's plan for salvation also says one must repent of their sins in order to become a Christian, a member of the church of Christ. The Lord himself made this requirement. I didn't. Yet, brethren, the church of Christ almost stands alone virtually alone in the modern religious world and requiring repentance as necessary for salvation. The re what, there's a reason for that. The reason is because the most difficult command, I think, in God's plan of salvation. In order to turn to God and obey His Son, you must first disobey yourself. Self controls modern society. Self controls modern society. Few want to come along and say and realize, hey, I've sinned. I've sinned and I need to repent. Most will condescend to feel sorry for themselves, as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, worldly sorrow. They don't have that godly sorrow. But they refuse to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and say as the Lord said, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew 26, verse 39. A member of the Church of Christ, a faithful member of the church, can know that they have bent their will to God's will by repenting of their sins as commanded. But many people today don't. Many denominations, and I dare say some brethren, many brethren, accept unrepentant sinners, unrepentant homosexuals, fornicators, adulterers, gamblers, drunkards, all of that contrary to the law of Christ. They haven't repented. They're still obeying self, and they have not submitted yet. But also in God's plan of salvation is confession. One must confess before men that Jesus is the Son of the living God in order to be saved and added to the church. The Ethiopian in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, Says and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? What hindered the Ethiopian? Philip told him. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, verse 36 to 37. That good confession is all that stood between him and being united with Christ in baptism. Now, that confession is not some man-made, mad-inspired, fancy-ancy confession of faith. It's just that simple admission that Jesus is the Savior, the Son of God, and the administrator of baptism, of this candidate for baptism. They ask the candidate that life-changing question that I've asked many times, and some of you I have too, I know. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? My friends, when you answer in the affirmative, it reaches the very throne of God. Matthew 10, verse 32. It makes the devil tremble. Someday, even the most hardened sinner will bend their knee and affirm that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Philippians chapter 2. But then it'll be too late. And we, as members of Faithful members of the Church of Christ can know that we have been saved because we've obeyed that command. 
part of God's plan of salvation. Unless we forget that final part. One must be baptized, buried in water for remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. Born of the water and the Spirit, Acts 3, John 3, verse 5. In order to be saved and added to the church of Christ. But many people in this world in their quest for waterless salvation and quick prayerism, they've disregarded what stands between that believing, penitent, confessing sinner and the Christian who's been forgiven from all that. It's, repent, it's baptism for the remission of sins that one may be united with their Savior and receive those spiritual blessings that can only be found in the church building. No, in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. A person being baptized is doing what God said and the way God said it for the reasons God has given Brethren, that knowledge also should give us courage and resolve. But we've done that. When we've done what the word of God says to do to enter Christ's church, to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized for mission of sins, then and only then can we say that we have called upon the name of the Lord. Acts 22, verse 16. We can know that we have been saved from our sins and added to the church. We can know that. What a great thing. What a wonderful thought to go through eternity. Know if you have done the Lord's will and are a member of his kingdom. But another mark of the church is that the church of Christ believes and teaches the authority of the scriptures. Many have talked about this. Brethren, we should all realize that the Bible, the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. And the church of Christ, for the church of Christ, is the final authority in matters of life and worship. It is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. You know, everyone in this world is under authority. And Brother Skip was driving us back tonight. He was under authority. <laughs> His wife was in the back seat. No, no, I'm sorry. I was kidding. No, she's a very good. I, I was a back seat driver, too. I've, been, I've, I've licensed that effect. Uh, but we are all under authority. And you know, one of the great examples of that concept is the, the centurion in Luke chapter 7. Came to the Lord, we all know the story, to have his servant healed, or actually sent someone. And Jesus got close and said, I'll come, and got close to his house, and he comes out and says, says, Lord, I'm not worthy, don't come in. He says, wherefore, neither I myself worthy to come unto thee. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say to one, go, and he goeth. To another, come, and he cometh. To my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And the Lord was amazed. He was amazed at this Gentile's profound common sense insight into the ways of God. To me today, as others have mentioned their lectureship, do not have the foggiest idea about authority in the realm of religion. Their authority is their religious tradition. Oh, my faith practice is such and such. Or their whims and feelings. Some religious experience they think they had. Some latter-day revelation or a creed or a discipline. And you know, these same people will fastidiously follow the rules of football, baseball, basketball, hockey, lacrosse, what else are I out? Ping pong, the IRS. They'll follow that, but they don't see any reason to follow the Bible, God's rule book. Brethren, the Church of Christ was established on the rock of objective truth, John 8, verse 31, 32. And how was that supplied? Did it just come into their mind? No, it was supplied by divine revelation. Jude verse 3, the faith that was once delivered to the saints. The church doesn't care about the peeper, peeping and muttering of ancient or modern mysticism. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 19, read that verse sometime. She declines the allurements of ever-changing falsehood of pseudoscience. Doesn't lean upon the broken reed of the world of professional doubters who deem themselves biblical scholars. Church of Christ believes in the inspiration and authority of the scriptures. That authority comes from Christ and his apostles. 
What they left us, brethren, was the Scripture. 2 Peter 3, verse 10. Yet many today are so sophisticated. They can't handle that. They don't fear and tremble when the word of God is, is read. They forget the many warnings to handle the word of God the right way, to hear and obey the word, to do all things by the authority in the name of the Lord, Colossians 3, verse 17, to not go beyond the things that are written, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Why has that happened? Well, in the church, the reason why people got biblical authority is because we've had two generations of liberalism. Watered down, relevant preaching. They couldn't save a church mouse, much less a field mouse. That doesn't broach the topics of inspiration, biblical authority, that have produced members who know very little of God's word, and they don't surely don't know how to correctly interpret it. Of identifying the mark of the church is it believes in the inspired inspiration of the Bible and the authority that it gives. Another identifying mark is the Church of Christ teaches that men must be saved from their sins. And that's a, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? The faithful Christian knows that, you know, they can't hardly believe that someone that claims they believe the Bible, and there's a lot of people out there that claim they believe the Bible, but they maintain, if not overtly, that a sinner doesn't need to be saved from his sins, his or her sins. That's the messages you find, the subliminal, almost subliminal message you find in mainline denominations and some liberal brethren today. This idea of toleration. Well, you know, sin isn't really sin. For example, drunkenness. By that I mean one drink of ethyl alcohol one or more drinks, is tolerated in these rooms as, as long as it's done in moderation, whatever that is. And it doesn't lead to alcoholism, which is an illness, is a disease, rather than what it really is, sin, and a spiritual illness. That reflects the growing, what I call the Sodom and Gomorrah mentality of American society that downgrades sins like premarital sex, Adultery, homosexuality, and transvestism, for example, as a mistake, an alternate lifestyle, or even some genetic thing you've got there that you can't help, you had no choice in, rather than a pernicious sin against the creator in one's own body. Religious circles accept unrepentant sinners into their ranks all the time. Sometimes they kind of halfway tolerate them while kind of holding their noses, and others just outright accept them. And, you know, it reminds me of what Apostle Paul said in Romans 6, verse 1. Shall we continue with sin that grace may abound? Many people today would say, of course. <laughs> what did Paul say? King James Version. God forbid. Verse 2. But the Bible is emphatic about sin. Sin is the soul killer. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Sin is a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, verse 4. It can separate us from the one that made us for all eternity. Jesus died on that cross, not so that you and I can continue to sin. He died on that cross so that our sins would be remitted, taken away, wiped clean. This is the reason he died that humiliating death, that he opened up the way out of spiritual death, sin, into spiritual life. Praise be unto him. He's done that. One of the marks of the early church, and it should be one of the marks today, is that the church is emphatic about sin as the Bible is emphatic. The New Testament church did not tolerate sin anyway. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, Now we command you, command you brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would draw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after addition which he received of us. That mark of distinction distinctiveness should be present in each faithful church of Christ but many members today continue to allow sinful, sinfulness and that's a mark of unfaithfulness to tolerate sin but the true church teaches about sin and its cure 
Acts 2, verse 38. We often forget it says repent for remission of sins. Be baptized for remission of sins. They fail to tell them to repent. That faithful church does not attempt to baptize for remission of sins those who have not turned. As Jesus said, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith is in me. Acts 26, verse 18, the Lord told Saul. But many brethren find themselves in congregations that refuse to teach against sin and do not dare practice church discipline. And you know when you find yourself in that situation, you should flee like Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife. The Lord Jesus told the church at Thyatira if they did not discipline the false prophetess and fornicator Jezebel, he would cast her into great tribulation and kill her children with death, Revelation 2. And that was in spite of all their works of charity and service and faith, verse 19. And they would find themselves in that body that the Lord says, I don't know who you are on the day of judgment, Matthew 7, verse 23. Identifying marks the church. Another identifying mark the church this morning is, this afternoon rather, is the Church of Christ teaches that Christianity is undenominational. You know, if you read the New Testament, you see the Church of Christ was not denomination. Not denomination. It was a ch- wasn't a child of religious division. It was that one united body of Christ that we've talked about it all week. Brethren, we need to ask the world this question. What church was Paul, Peter, Silas, Phoebe, and so forth, all those Christians in the New Testament, what were they a member of? They weren't a member of a denomination. There weren't any. They were members of the church that Jesus purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28. There were no other churches in the first century world, but only congregations of that one body. But in this world, especially in the United States, we have this spirit of pluralism and ecumenism that enables all these even unaffiliated, they think, churches to advertise themselves as non-denominational. While again, what do they really want? They want that warm body in the pew. So they're, let's not offend anyone, let's be non-denominational. They have this false perception, oh, we're all going to heaven, we're just going by different ways. They get all warm and cuddly and sing kumbaya to the accompaniment of a steel guitar while they're counting the money in the collection plate. Kumbaya. I'm sorry, we'll get into that. I'll scare you off. <laughs> Brother Chumley knows that he can sing for you later. This is not a mark of the New Testament church. The Bible warns us against proclaiming, accepting someone who says, oh, I'm a brother that does not follow the doctrine of Christ. Another mark of the church is that it teaches that the church can be restored. You know, for centuries there are people that have hungered and thirsted after righteousness. They want to return to the Bible. They want to give up all their creeds and everything and return to the Word of God. They want to restore that pattern of worship that we read in the New Testament we practice this week. They want to do that. They begin by acknowledging the truth about all that. I recently read a news report that I believe every one of us wishes they could witness. Back in June of 2011, two young evangelists, Brethren Joseph Kati and Marcus Kushu of Bagdogra, India, challenged a nominational preacher named Surin Shinashi to a debate. The pastor, as he called himself, agreed to discuss three topics. How can we know we are in the true church? Should we use the Bible only in the work and worship of the church? And number three, the New Testament church versus the Free Will Baptist Church. The debate took place July 1st, 2011, in the Free Will Baptist Church building in Goshpur, a nearby town. Approximately 45 were in attendance. Every speaker took 30 minutes in intervals to speak. The pastor became agitated, demanded everyone close their Bibles, and that his opponent not preach about the church, but rather preach Jesus. 
The evangelists persisted in discussing the church that Jesus built was not a man-made church. At the end of that debate, 15 members of this Free Will Baptist Church came to the front and they said to their pastor, they said, why did you keep us in darkness? Why did you not reveal to us the truth that which we are now hearing? From now onwards, we tell you, Seren, we will no more be in the Free Will Baptist Church. We would like to study with these brethren here who are from the original church, as they claim, that we may know about this church. The next day, five men, including an 86-year-old man, came and studied with the brethren. The brethren revealed every truth and hid nothing from them. This included the manner of the original church, baptism, plan of salvation, pattern of worship. At the end of the study, it was reported that five men began weeping and said, we have wasted our lives. The time that should be given to the original church, we gave to nothing. We repent and are ready for baptism because furthermore, we don't want to risk our salvation. They were baptized, new congregation of the Lord's church was established. Brother, I wept when I read that. We need to pray each day that the word of God will open the hearts of our nation. Beginning with our president, by the way. Let us pray with boldness that we proclaim the truth that we know can set man free. Acts 26, verse 18 again, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, the power of Satan unto God, and the power of Satan, and, and may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by, by faith in me, Jesus said. Perhaps you want to obey the words of Jesus Christ tonight. Put your Lord's Lord on in baptism, and come out of that darkness and into the light. This you need tonight. Please come as we stand and sing.